Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Net Zero Energy Building Knowledge Series to the 40th episode of our webinar series. Uh, in no time, we are in December 2020. I'm sure everyone's glad that this year is coming, indeed coming to an end very soon rather than later. So today we have an interesting uh, session uh, with a spotlight on a, a interesting project and i think it will leave us with a lot of optimism and things to look forward to in the um, next year so as usual i would first uh, give an introduction to what the program is about and also talk about the matri uh, uh, program in general uh, the nz knowledge series is a platform for industry to showcase their projects products technology and even ideas to fuel discussions on energy efficiency and grow engagements for net zero energy buildings in India. This program is executed under the METRI program funded by USAID. METRI is an acronym for Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. You can know more about the program on its website, uh, metri.edsglobal.com. I'm Deepa, I am an architect and a uh, a sustainability consultant at Environmental Design Solutions, and I shall be the session moderator today. Metri three main program areas, which are energy efficiency in buildings, sustainable cooling, and training and consumer engagement. The program works in partnership with several organizations such as Energy Efficiency Services Limited, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, and others to implement various initiatives. The market transformation approach includes creating business opportunities for the private sector, scaling up of potential initiatives, enabling policies, as well as providing training for net zero energy buildings. Metri supporting efforts moving towards a super efficient and net zero energy target for buildings in India. The NZEP Knowledge Portal is a one-stop site for information on NZEPs. You may explore this further on our site, nzeb.in. Now, our webinar today is about a building. Sorry, let me go here. Um, that is net zero energy and uh, low carbon by design, the Bayalpata Hospital. Now, generally speaking, a hospital has many complex functional requirements. And in many ways, it has a strong influence on the overall design and performance of the building. The Bayalpata Medical Complex is spread across seven and a half acres hilltop site in Nepal. Yet it is nothing like what a typical hospital looks like and performs like. The project is modest in scale, uses low-tech construction methods, on-site materials, has very low energy demand, integrates solar energy, and many more features in it. So let's learn about the story of this building from our expert speaker today, Tyler Sarwan. Tyler is an architect and project director at Sharon Davis Design and was the project manager for the Bayalpata Hospital, which is a rammed earth medical campus in the Himalayas for Nepal's Ministry of Health and Population. Uh, Tyler lived in uh, Botswana from 2014 to 17 for on-site construction administration of the Botswana Innovation Hub, an 85 million USD tech incubator for the country's Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research, Science and Technology. Sharon Davis Design is an award-winning studio based in New York City with a focus on low-carbon, cost-conscious international projects for marginalized communities. The office prioritizes social justice, economic empowerment, and environmental sustainability and has gained renown for its ability to deliver both aesthetic accomplishment and social benefit. Uh, without uh, further ado, I uh, welcome you, uh, Tyler, to this webinar. Uh, Tyler is joining us from Kentucky in the US. 
it's morning, 7.30 a.m. for him. And uh, we really look forward to learning more about the project. I'm Nikki, the presenter, and uh, over to you. Great, thank you, Deepa. Can you see my screen now? Let's see. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, yes. great. So thank you for that introduction, and uh, let me just make sure I can see my notes here. And thank you also for the opportunity to share the story of the Biopata Hospital. Uh, as you mentioned, Deepa, that we are a small design practice. We're based in New York. Um, I live there typically, but I'm here in Kentucky visiting family over the holidays. Uh, we often work abroad on challenging projects in rural areas and often with underrepresented communities. And this project was no exception. I'll first begin by spending about five to 10 minutes introducing the context of the hospital and the particular challenges that we were trying to address with our design. Then we'll go through our design strategies and do a walkthrough of the completed campus. And then I'll com conclude with a brief summary of the project. So Nepal is an incredibly beautiful country with rice fields that terrace the countryside, ornate temples and rich cultural traditions, and of course the majestic Himalayan mountains. But Nepal's rugged terrain makes most of the country highly inaccessible, limiting access to healthcare facilities. And its vulnerability to natural disasters further complicates basic infrastructure and social services. In rural Nepal, the doctor to patient ratio is on average 150 times worse than is recommended by the World Health Organization. Interpossible Health and Yaya Health, sister organizations based in New York and Kathmandu, who have partnered with Nepal's Ministry of Health and Population to offer free, high quality medical care in rural Nepal. In 2009, Possible Health reopened an abandoned hospital on a three hectare site in Acham, a district where there was not a single doctor for a population of a quarter of a million people. Soon these facilities were at capacity and Possible Health reached out to us with a bold vision and a limited budget to phase out these original buildings, replacing them with an upgraded expanded hospital complex. At the time, the buildings had no formal sanitation system, electricity was unreliable, and access to clean water was limited. Also, there was no insulation or climate control, allowing indoor temperatures to range between 4 and 40 degrees Celsius. The hospital is located in the Himalayan foothills in one of Nepal's most inaccessible regions where around half the population lives, or lives below the poverty line. The remote location had a major impact on the way that we thought about the transportation of building supplies to the site and the power source for the hospital. Access to the hospital is by a single two-lane highway that winds through the Himalayan foothills. And these rural roads can easily be blocked by fallen rock and washouts during the monsoons. Biopata is a 10 hour drive from the nearest regional airport in Dungadi at the Indian border and a several day drive uh, from Kathmandu. Just to drive to Dungadi uh, from Kathmandu takes about two days and then it's another day into the hills to reach the hospital. And technically, as you can see here, Delhi is closer to the site, but importing building supplies from India can be costly and result in delays by customs. The shipping of building supplies to a remote location like this was cost prohibitive for our budget, but is also costly from a standpoint of carbon. So one challenge for us was how can we build with low tech, locally available materials? Another challenge was the power supply. The remote regions of Nepal are often underserved by the country's electrical grid, which is primarily built up in the central part of the country here around Kathmandu, and to the west around Pokhara, uh, Nepal's second largest city. Due to supply shortages, however, even grid connectivity does not guarantee electricity. 
the situation has drastically improved, but as we set out to design the hospital, load shedding could occur up to 18 hours a day during the dry season. For a hospital that has critical life-saving equipment, a lack of reliable power was a major risk to the project. So another challenge that we faced was how do we reduce the hospital's dependence on electricity and or provide an alternative energy source for its power. Another aspect of the challenging terrain and the lack of infrastructure is that public transportation in the region is also extremely limited. Consequently, most patients travel to the hospital on foot, even pregnant women. For patients already based in Acham, this is a journey that can take an entire day. But if coming from surrounding districts, the walk can take up to five or six days. While there are other healthcare facilities in the region, the private hospitals are unaffordable to most and the few public hospitals are understaffed and underfunded. Thus, poor patients in need will travel further distances to Biopata in order to seek affordable treatment. And with limited telephone access, as many as 500 new patients arrive unannounced each morning and then must wait for hours and sometimes even overnight to be seen. So from the standpoint of the hospital's patients, Another challenge we confronted was how to create a welcoming, safe space for patients who have traveled so far despite illness or health issues, and some of whom may have never even been to a hospital before. So how did we respond to these challenges? The original hospital was disorganized with inefficient workflow and no formal waiting areas. Patients were scattered informally around the various buildings, as you can see here, highlighted in orange. On our first trip, we were shocked to see doctors running back and forth between the emergency room here at the outpatient building and surgery all the way at the other end of the campus, through, but through throngs of waiting patients. So our master plan grouped the more public outpatient functions shown in orange here around a primary central courtyard, and then located the inpatient facilities here shown in blue around a smaller private courtyard beyond. We kept staff housing down the hill away from the main buildings. So I'll just quickly run through these. You're looking at the ER building here at the front of the campus. This is actually north to your right. So we've had to rotate the plan main road here to the left. You have your outpatient building around the main courtyard, and then administration, antenatal care, surgery, and an inpatient building all around the upper courtyard, staff housing, and a dormitory. So here you can see how we use the topography to naturally articulate the various spaces with the administrative building at the highest point on the campus overlooking the rest of the, the buildings and the staff housing in the more secluded location downhill. In form and materiality, we were inspired by the vernacular structures that we found surrounding the hospital. Houses in Acham are two to three stories and are constructed of mortared stone and finished with paint and reddish earthen stucco. Many historic structures across the Himalayas for instance, the Tabo Monastery in Himachal Pradesh are made of rammed earth, a technique where earth is compressed into formwork. Indeed, mud and earth construction techniques are found in traditional and vernacular architecture throughout the world. And in our previous work, we have employed earth construction techniques such as compressed earth block and earth bags. And for our Women's Opportunity Center project in Rwanda, which was completed in 2013, we helped form a women's brick making cooperative as a way to create locally available building supplies while also providing job training and employment opportunities. And this brick making co op uh, permitted the creation of some beautiful spaces, such as these circular classrooms, um, but in a low cost, low tech way without having to import materials from long distances. Earth construction can be challenging in earthquake-prone areas of the world, however, 
And we all know that uh, Nepal is in a seismically active high-risk area. Many historic earthen structures collapsed in the 2015 earthquakes. So for the hospital, we proposed cement stabilized reinforced rammed earth, which has better seismic resistance, but still has the earthen quality that is so familiar to patients. Um, in fact, some of the doctors have, have told us that they feel very at home in these spaces, which is a big contrast to the institutional architecture that you would typically expect of a hospital um, because the earthen quality is something that they grew up in uh, in these rural homes. So there were many advantages for us to using reinforced rammed earth. Um, number one, even with adding cement content to improve the stability of the soil, rammed earth still uses far less cement than concrete. So it has lower embodied carbon. Number two, because the soil is locally available, we could reduce transportation costs of the building materials and thus carbon emissions. Three, while rammed earth is labor intensive, it's also low tech. You don't need specialized knowledge to help build these walls. But lastly, and perhaps most importantly, rammed earth has thermal mass, which slows down heat transfer between the interior and the exterior. With rammed earth, we could passively control indoor temperatures without resorting to mechanical heating and cooling. And thus we could reduce the building's electricity usage. The only rooms in the new hospital that have air conditioning are the two operating theaters, which was a requirement for the sterility. So this diagram just shows how that thermal mass works in practice. The outdoor temperatures shown here in gray and the indoor temperature in blue. And what you can see is that throughout the day, as the temperature rises and then as the sun starts to set, the temperature cools off again. Because it takes time for the rammed earth to transfer that heat, there is this lag time, a kind of shift in the two waves. But because of this shift of a couple hours after the outdoor temperature has peaked and started to drop, that heat transfer begins to reverse, meaning there's also this damping effect, which uh, basically means that the interior temperature can never quite get as cold or hot as what the exterior temperature uh, is doing. And this all happens without insulation. It's just through the thermal mass. So before we walk through the other design strategies, uh, I just wanted to take you quickly through the rammed earth construction process and show you some construction photos in case you're not familiar with this construction technique. So we sourced all the soil locally. Uh, a mortared stone foundation and concrete plinth beam ties everything together at the base. Aggregate is then uh, removed from the soil and the 6% cement added in. This mix is then tamped into the formwork by hand. And lastly, form ties are filled and a ring beam ties together the wall segments at the top. Just let this play through once more in case there's a bit of a lag. So here you see one of the mortared stone foundation walls going in. And we also used this mortared stone technique for all exterior stairs and retaining walls. So this reduced the you know, cement content of the project as well. We used plastic formwork, which is durable and reusable throughout the entire job. On the left, you see the formwork empty, ready to be filled with the soil. And on the right, after the first few layers of the wall have been completed and the um, formwork has been shifted up. Here's a view of the tamping process with eight men uh, compressing the soil at the same time on this particular segment of wall. So it is labor intensive, but you can get a lot of people up there working simultaneously. Here you see a first layer of earth. So it's compressed within the formwork. And these are the steel reinforcing bars that are rising through that. Once that first layer is complete, you raise the formwork and the process continues just all the way up. So we can see in these next few images, the wall just climbs higher and higher. 
And then after the tamping is complete, a concrete ring beam is added to tie the wall segments together at the top. And concrete sills can be added to the windows and all exposed uh, horizontal surfaces. And then of course, once the walls are in, the, the roof and flooring can be completed in any interior partitions. So now that um, we've gone through that construction process, I just wanted to go back to the section drawing to introduce our other sustainable design strategies that we used to limit our carbon footprint and get to net zero. We chose to limit the width of each building so that all interior spaces have access to natural light and air. Clear story windows at the roof level, uh, you can see here, I get my cursor, uh, along, they run always in the east-west direction and are facing south. Um, these provide additional daylighting from above. So there's a nice top light that comes into a lot of the spaces and it reduces the use of artificial lighting. These clear story windows are also operable, so they allow stack ventilation for passive cooling, as you see here. And I think we'll revisit this section in a few minutes. We also integrated shading canopies um, that wrap the buildings throughout the campus, and these provide cover during the rainy season as well as from the sun. The roofs are pitched at an angle optimized for the 100 kilowatt photovoltaic system, which produces more than enough electricity to power the entire facility, including all the medical equipment. So the energy that we do use is replaced by the energy produced on site resulting in a net zero building. We also incorporated water management strategies, including gray water collection for irrigation purposes and bioswales to manage stormwater erosion and runoff. In the staff housing, which you're seeing here, individual solar hot water heaters provide hot water to each dwelling. All right, so now let's finally turn to the results and walk through the campus looking in a little bit more detail at each building. So patients enter the campus from the main road. Here you're seeing the main entrance. They first register at the building on the left before proceeding through the open passageway. Here we're seeing that uh, polycarbonate canopy structure and some of the waiting area the pharmacy and registration windows, which are along this front facade. And beneath the canopies are these built-in benches for waiting patients. On the interior of this, um, this first kind of ER building, this um, emergency department, uh, we can see the effect of the clear story windows in spaces such as this laboratory on the left and the emergency room itself on the right. The ER building also houses other diagnostic functions such as x-ray equipment. And here is that detailed section through the building which just explains some of these systems. You can see the translucent canopy at the front of the campus, the photovoltaic panels that are inclined at a kind of optimized angle for capturing the sun, the clear story window with the kind of broken roof line here that allows the daylight to enter, and there are actually interior windows along the corridor uh, to actually allow this light to sort of filter be between the various spaces on the interior. And again, these are operable, so uh, you can open the windows in good weather and actually get an air flow for passive cooling. This view from higher up the main road shows three of these three features clearly with the clear story stretching along the full length of the building the photovoltaic panels, and then the polycarbonate shading below. So now we have passed through the main building through this open air passageway, and we're in the central public courtyard, the primary waiting area for patients. In hot weather, patients sit under these polycarbonate canopies, um, but this video was taken a few weeks ago, and patients have moved out into the sun to wait during the slightly colder weather. From this main courtyard, open air passageways within the outpatient department lead to medical offices and more secluded balconies. Um, just as a quick aside, on the right is Dr. Reka's office. 
Uh, incredibly, she's the only dentist and oral surgeon in Western Nepal, and she serves a population of 1 million people, um, basically all by herself. And so here's a plan of this outpatient building where you can see how the building's actually divided up into three segments. This is on the main level. Um, there's a basement level below this. Um, and these, there's the exterior waiting and then these two sort of breezeways that connect to the verandas. And this promotes airflow and also access to these various offices. And some of the design of this structure um, is, it's actually helpful to look at the model, one of the models that we built um, that shows that actually from how the roof is continuous over these breezeways. Um, and you can see that the roof line from the exterior of the building reads as continuous, but actually from the inside, it's broken by the clear story and the, the two different angles, uh, one for the south facing roof slope with the photovoltaics and the other with the north side, north facing. Here's just a zoom in of that balcony condition and the clear story windows above. So in all the medical buildings, we plastered the rammed earth on the interiors, both to brighten the spaces and create a cleanable surface. The exterior of the rammed earth is sealed only with linseed oil. So in that sense, it's very low tech. The east side of the public courtyard is left open and the canopy frames views to the mountains beyond. And now we're moving north and we see the smaller, more private courtyard in the distance. The campus has special areas for women, including the antenatal exam room on the left and the maternity ward on the right. Maternal health happens to be a main focus of the hospital because the region has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in Nepal. So these more private spaces open onto this upper more secluded courtyard. And the canopy wraps around each building, providing cover for these expecting mothers outside the maternity ward here. The inpatient block looks very similar to the outpatient building uh, from the exterior, but the verandas in this case are private to each ward instead of connecting to the main courtyard. These uh, verandas are very popular spaces for the admitted patients, especially in the early morning sun. They face east. And here are just a few portraits of some of the patients uh, in that upper courtyard. Because the region is agrarian, it requires lots of manual labor. There's a lot of risk of injury just in farming activities. And many of the patients arrive to the hospital with broken bones. So opposite the inpatient department is the administration building that you're seeing here up on the hill. Access is through stone stairs and there's a ramp at the other end of this um, image. So the admin building overlooks the rest of the campus and you see here from the plan, it's a fairly simple building with a central corridor, offices and meeting rooms. Um, but maybe its main feature is this cafeteria that actually spans from east to west across the full building. And here you get a view of the interior of that canteen with the large windows overlooking the campus and that central corridor with some of the uh, diffuse light coming in and uh, naturally lighting this corridor instead of through artificial means. And here we have a west, the west side of the administration building. So below the medical campus is the staff housing. And here you're seeing just three of those staff houses. There were 10 that were actually constructed. And the relationship between the staff housing to the main medical buildings beyond. And if we look at a plan, all of these homes are two bedrooms with the main living space in, in between. This allows some families to either occupy um, the, the house as a single family, but potentially with uh, children's bedrooms here, or to have extended family members, or I believe even one family is renting out this bedroom. So it actually becomes uh, multifamily. And so we were able to base the housing off just the same unit that got repeated, rotated and mirrored to create kind of variation on the site, which you'll see in these next images. 
here's just a few views of the interior. So I would just point out that on the medical buildings, we integrated concrete columns within the design to support some of the roof loads. And that was because of just the higher safety factor that was required of the medical building. Um, but on the housing, the dormitory and the staff housing, the rammed earth is entirely load bearing and there's no concrete columns. And we also left the rammed earth exposed on the interiors of these spaces. Some canopy trellis structures that people um, use to actually hang laundry out to dry. And here you see a view of these housing together. They're sort of laid out in a, a village style. The landscape here hasn't, hasn't grown in yet, but you're seeing one of the bioswales that hasn't been planted here in the foreground. So for the doctors who live here with their families, Biopata is not only an institution, but it's a home, a place to raise a family. And lastly, here's the dormitory for staff and visitors, which is nestled into the hillside below stone retaining walls. In the plan, you see there are two wings, uh, four bedrooms per wing along just a single loaded corridor. These bedrooms face out to the view. And in the middle, we have the kitchen and dining and two bathrooms. So these two wings allow um, visitors to segregate by gender. You've got men and women on two different sides, um, not having to share a bathroom. This dormitory is actually one of the more sort of secluded spaces because it's tucked down the hill um, behind these retaining walls. And from it has a very different view depending on which angle that you're approaching the building from. Interior, again, we have just that exposed rammed earth, uh, exposed wood ceilings, and built-in seating along the corridor. So just to conclude this, um, this section, I wanted to walk through the phasing of the project because one interesting thing that we had to confront, another challenge that I didn't mention earlier is that the existing hospital needed to remain operational through the, throughout the entire construction. So we had to carefully sequence the way that we built the project over the course of basically five years in order to switch around all the different program uh, between buildings before they were demolished to replace them with new uh, buildings. So we're going to look here that starting in at the end of 2014, when we began the project, we the very first project was this dormitory. And not six months within that construction, the earthquakes uh, of 2015 struck, which delayed the project for about six months uh, due to avalanches on the on the road. That dormitory was completed in 2016, and we began the staff housing. As the staff housing were completed, we moved into the medical campus. And so the very first building that was completed was this inpatient building. And you can see here its proximity to uh, another one of the existing structures. So that required, you see it here, some very careful uh, coordination with the construction not to undermine the existing buildings before they were demolished. And then the admin building flanking these existing buildings, which once the admin building was complete with the canteen, it allowed us to actually build, we built a second phase of housing as we were building the outpatient building as well. Once the outpatient building was complete, we could demolish the existing outpatient building for the ER. And you see here some of the temporary structures that had to be put up um, to facilitate patients in the middle of this construction construction zone. And finally, the ER building, and then the two last buildings, the antenatal care and the surgery, which allowed the very final building to be uh, demolished. And the final handover was just late last year, um, just before the coronavirus pandemic hit. And we're very proud that the hospital is now serving over 100,000 patients a year, which is eight times its original capacity. To commemorate the completion of the project, our contractor, Sabeti Associates, built a small temple to Shiva on the hillside overlooking the hospital. And they explained to us that Shiva represents the natural cycle of destruction and creation and is symbolic of the hospital's rejuvenation as a model for rural healthcare. 
So in the five minutes I have remaining, just wanted to look quickly back at the issues of net zero energy and low carbon. So as I'm sure you're all aware, it's estimated that between their construction and their operation, buildings contribute to nearly 40% of global carbon emissions with the everyday operation of the building contributing the majority of these emissions. And we think of building operations as resulting in operational carbon and the building materials and construction as embodied carbon because the materials represent the energy that was put into their manufacture. Achieving net zero energy efficiency can't be the only goal for architects wishing to reduce carbon emissions because it's actually the embodied carbon of a building that has a greater short-term impact on climate change. And this is shown in the diagram on the right because the upfront carbon emitted during a building's construction is fixed. So it lasts the lifetime of a building and it makes up the building's total carbon put footprint at the early uh, stages of its life as this operational carbon slowly accrues over time. So the building could be extremely energy efficient and this line would even be less steep, uh, but you would still have all that embodied carbon that was the result of the building's construction. So it's equally important that we also consider embodied carbon, not just operational carbon. So just to summarize, these are the ways um, that we try to reduce both our operational carbon shown on the left, uh, which was trying to reduce the need for electricity in the first place through natural light, ventilation, the clear stories, the building massing, and the thermal mass of the rammed earth itself, and then offsetting that electricity used through solar panels. And then on the right, the embodied carbon, which are the materials itself and trying to reduce transportation. So as you know, uh, or as, may, as you may know, over the next 35 years, it's estimated that 2.5 trillion square feet of buildings are expected to be constructed or renovated globally. And this chart shows the amount of current built area in the lighter blue bars by country or continent with the darker blue, the projections in the next 10 years and the gray bar, the amount of floor area projected by the year 2050. And if we just highlight North America at the top and India in the middle, we see that India currently has less building floor area than North America, but in the next 30 years, increasing urbanization and a massive building boom will lead India to surpass the United States and Canada in built area by 2050, second only to China. So you, sorry, let me go back. I just want to point out that um, we feel that architects and policymakers in India specifically have a huge opportunity to confront these global environmental challenges that we're collectively facing. So quickly before I open up to questions, I just wanna acknowledge that the Biopata Hospital project was made possible through our strong partnerships from our clients and stakeholders and the Ministry of Health to our collaborators and consultants on the engineering side to our builders and installers. And we also want to acknowledge that the Biopata Hospital medical staff uh, who are so dedicated to the work that they actually lived on the hospital grounds even during the construction site for the past five years. And given the coronavirus pandemic, we're all keenly aware of how critical our doctors and nurses are to public health across the world, and especially in underserved areas like Acham. So we just wanted to acknowledge them as well. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tyler, for sharing the process and even the details uh, of construction, the materials used in this project. Uh, yeah, I think not just India, even the entire tropical kind of uh, belt is where all the opportunities exist that we need to tap into for the future building stock. And uh, hopefully we are headed in the direction of achieving a net zero in the near future, because clearly, uh it's possible to do so um so we do have uh, questions uh coming in uh so i just want to make an announcement that if you have any questions do send it uh, in the chat box so we can uh take it up um uh, in a bit so 
um, before, okay, let's just take uh, the questions directly uh, from the audience. The first one coming from uh, uh, Vardhan. Um, getting a water supply must have been difficult. What kind of arrangement has been made for storing rainwater in this project? Yeah, that's a great question. And I didn't show an image of it, but that was one of the initial tasks was to locate and secure a reliable water source. So we worked with our civil engineer to actually draw from three small springs. There's a, a hillside be behind the hospital to the south. And we basically drew from these three small springs and there are large cisterns that are sitting just across the street from the hospital on the hillside. And they are drawing water into those cisterns and then it's gravity fed into the hospital itself. Right. Um, the next question is uh, from uh, Shamit. How have the stabilized mud blocks fared over the last five years in terms of maintenance, especially indoors where hospitals require sterile surfaces? That's another good question. The, um, as you may have seen in some of the images in all the medical buildings, we did seal and uh, plaster all the interior surfaces so that you're not actually interfacing directly with the rammed earth on the interior spaces. So they are all cleanable. And I think we, uh, let's see, on the operating theater building, of course, there was an even higher standard. So there were um, anti-microbial um, surfaces in that space. Um, I will say on where we have, I think, more concerns about the um, durability is on the exterior of the buildings. And I think one thing we've noticed is the base of the buildings as they meet the ground, um, I don't know if you can see maybe in the image that you're looking at on the screen there. Um, because the rainwater, as it sort of splashes back on the building, you get some potential for like um, weathering, mold, mildew along the base. So um, that's something that has to be maintained. And I think uh, if we were to, you know, look at this, studying this particular um, typology again, we would look at potentially putting uh, stone along the base or um, overhangs to start to limit some of that. Um, so that is a maintenance uh, concern. Sure. Uh, next question from Fernando. How is the uh, tightness in the building salt? The air tightness? I, I guess, you yeah, think? I guess that's okay. what they mean. Sure. So what's interesting about rammed earth is that you're actually not, you don't want to promote tightness um, in the sense that this is a very different kind of um, energy efficiency, if you will. The rammed earth is a mass wall, so it uh, is, is vapor permeable. Uh, it allows moisture to pass slowly through it, which allows the wall to dry, dry out after it gets wet. Um, and so that's actually something that you encourage. So in lieu of, let's say, a passive house building where you want to have a very, very airtight envelope, you also then have to, because it's so airtight, you have to have very robust uh, mechanical systems. So you're actually, you are controlling through insulation the amount of heating and cooling that's required within the building, um, but you're also using mechanical means to do that. In this case, the passive was much more, um, let's say a traditional form of a passive heating and cooling where we were trying to promote the natural flows of light and air through the building. So air tightness is actually not something that we were trying to promote here and, and would have been detrimental because that would have encouraged um, moisture concerns on the interior of the building. Right. More questions coming in, uh, great sure. ones. Um, uh, right, the next um, uh, question is from Yelda. Uh, is the maintenance needed for exterior exposed rammed earth walls? Yeah, so the linseed oil um, that is seals the building does need to be reapplied every few years, depending on you know, which parts of that exterior 
uh, rammed earth are more or less exposed to to the air. But um, that's that's something that's recommended. I think we'll see over time how these particular rammed earth walls fare. You know, rammed earth, as I pointed out, as in traditional structures, um, I don't think is maintained that way, um, and it has great durability. Uh, you know, these walls are 18 inches thick, so they actually do. Let's say the sediment starts to uh, erode very slightly over time, but these these walls should last centuries. Great. Um, next question from Harsh. Can you tell us why you opted for lightweight metal for the roof structure? Yeah, I, I don't know if I know all the history of the design decisions around the roof, but the the roofing was um, was something that we wanted to be able to rely on in terms of its durability. And so that roofing as a metal structure um, became, I think, our most convenient way to provide that, uh, that durability over time and that maintenance. Um, houses in the area do have a slate roofing, uh, which is actually quite beautiful and also would be locally available, but there's so much roof coverage here um, that we wanted to rely on a metal product in this case. Um, but I would point out that the roof structures uh, in all the buildings are insulated. So you not only have the, the metal on top, but you have interior insulation underneath, uh, which does prevent um, you know, that, that thermal break or create a thermal break between interior and exterior. There are a few um, overlapping questions on uh, waste management. How is the hospital and um, you know the other non-medical waste managed uh, in this project? Right. So um, there are. So we we had looked at both black water and gray water um, waste management and much more, let's say, complicated um, and complex systems. Um, those were actually ruled out for um, just cost purposes. And so there is um, basically a, se a septic field and septic system for the hospital's uh, water usage and waste control. Um, but the gray water that I mentioned earlier is being collected from all the sinks and the showers, and that's used for irrigation purposes. Um, when, the build, when these uh, photographs were taken, uh, a lot of the planting had not been done. That's going to be done over the course of the next few years in a kind of phased process. Um, and that gray water will be used for the irrigation purposes on the site. Right. Next question from Mayank. How difficult was it for your team to convince the client and users to use a material like earth and how difficult was it to train local masons and was the roof insulated three questions in that sure yes the roof is insulated uh, for sure the rammed earth the rammed earth was not common in nepal at the time it is becoming more increasingly common uh, over these past few years and i think this project specifically uh, has, has been a very good test case for the use of rammed earth. And the Nepal um, building department is now accepting it based on this particular project and the review of, of this project. Um, in terms of convincing the client, there was actually already a small rammed earth project located in Kathmandu. And our client had offices in Kathmandu. So one of the first steps is we actually went and saw that project. And then we also built a mock-up of the rammed earth in Kathmandu with our contractor, which allowed us all to study the construction process and understand how feasible this would be. So it was really through that mock-up process that we were able to demonstrate the you know, efficiency of this, to demonstrate that actually, once you have the formwork in place, you know, the formwork is very similar just to, to concrete formwork. Um, and so in that sense, it's not, uh, it's not a new technique. 
is merely in the more labor intensive aspects of the rammed earth um, that needed to be studied and the actual soil to cement mix um, in terms of getting that mixture right for the stability that we were after. So once all of that was worked through with both the contractor and the client, everyone was on board and uh, it was a smooth process after that. A couple of people have the uh, question on uh, the renewable energy. Um, mm -hmm. I'll read one of them. The other one is pretty much similar. Is the project 100% dependent on solar? Is there any alternative energy supply or, or like a fail safe for intensive care provided? Yeah, so that's a good question because um, there's a little bit of a nuance here in um, in the solar panels and how they are they're actually grid connected solar panels so the hospital's renewable energy source is entirely solar however because the campus was originally hooked into the grid it just wasn't very reliable we maintained that as opposed to trying to make the, the hospital entirely grid or off grid or grid independent so that means that there are the backup power would actually be the grid and in addition to that there's also um some uh sorry i'm blanking on the name but just backup generators uh for these life-saving medical equipment specifically like x-ray machines like the medical gas um, in case both those systems should be offline so one thing i would also note is that achan does not yet have um, net metering where the surplus power that's created through the solar panels, because there's actually a surplus, we're generating more electricity right now than we use. Um, typically that could go back into the grid, um, but if Achan's uh, infrastructure isn't quite there yet, it will come online in a couple of years where that, will, that kind of back and forth will be able to occur. So right now it's just one directional into the hospital and then these solar panels. So, um, there, we, we also don't need to rely on a lot of batteries to store the solar um, energy because solar panels can provide all the required electricity during the day and they could switch over onto the grid at night um, if, for instance, there was a particularly you know, cloudy set of days and they, they didn't have enough energy stored in the batteries. Uh, right. Uh, another couple of people asking similar questions on construction technique. How high can we go with the rammed earth walls? How many stories? Yeah, it, that, that is a limitation. Um, it's only about two stories um, unsupported, let's say, with other systems. In this case, we have columns integrated into these medical buildings that you're seeing um, on, on the screen there. And that allows us to essentially create um, a kind of um, hybrid system where the columns are helping to support some of the steel roof trusses and then the rammed earth is providing load bearing capacity for everything else and it's providing that lateral resistance in tandem with the columns and the concrete floor plates so um, unsupported or unintegrated with other systems rammed earth is even more limited uh, and how many stories it can span. And certainly the, the reinforcing that we added to the rammed earth also helps that. Um, but I'm not a structural engineer, but I would say, uh, you know, it's probably not feasible to go more than a few stories with, with this rammed earth. Uh, next question is uh, on uh, the building envelope. Uh, what material are the windows made of? And what strategies are used to prevent rainwater from entering interiors? Um, I guess the, the thought is because there are no overhangs, um, there's the potential for rain, rainwater to get into the windows. So um, the windows are, I believe they're aluminum. They are, um, you know, one of the more like standard elements for the, the project that couldn't obviously couldn't be built and manufactured directly on site. Um, there are, I think with these windows, I would point out that they are narrow and small and it's only the, the lower portion that's actually operable. Um, so in that sense, there's not a lot of, um, 
opportunity, I guess, for rainwater to come in. And the walls are are thick. They're about um, 450 millimeters or 18 inches deep. And so the majority of the windows um, are actually, or let's say the majority of the daylight um, is coming in through these clear story windows, which do have overhangs on them and are also operable. But I think that's, yeah, that's a good, a good question. And we have time for uh, two more last questions. Um, one from uh, Shatakshi. Uh, throughout the entire project, did you do a comparative analysis of carbon footprint and energy consumption with the older structure? We did not do that with the older structure, but what we have done is um, we've compared this project against what this what the same project would have um, consumed in terms of carbon or emitted in terms of carbon uh, if it were built in, let's say, concrete, entirely in concrete, um, which is perhaps you know not as realistic because you wouldn't have needed that amount of concrete, but the rammed earth and concrete both have that thermal mass. So in that sense, they're comparable materials. They're both load bearing, they're both mass walls. They both have that thermal mass. Um, and of course, when you do that comparison, you see really, really significant um, decreases in the, the carbon footprint of the building. So comparing it against what could have been if it were a more conventional building uh, using conventional building techniques, um, you're looking at a very different kind of project there. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we take uh, uh, one last question about uh, the clear story windows having, uh, I mean, why were the clear story windows kept facing south as that would bring in a lot of glare? But they generally are facing north. Yes, yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Um, I think part of it was the design in tandem with this photovoltaic system. So we are getting really good indirect light from the south that because of that overhang that you're seeing kind of on a, atop the clear story, we are preventing that direct light and therefore that direct glare. Um, but because the photovoltaic, um, the photovoltaics want to be optimized, let's say for the angle of the sun, sunlight, the azimuth or the angle of where the sun is striking those panels, we were able to drop the roof line there, which just created this zone for the clear story to come in still facing south with the rammed earth providing that kind of parapet wall on either side um, to sort of mask both of those um, design decisions. So we were trying, we were trying to avoid uh, in the design that sort of tacked on look that a lot of projects with solar panels have where they almost feel like an afterthought. We were designing specifically to try to integrate them within those roof scapes, both with the angle and the kind of uh, dimensions of those. And that's, I think, how the clear story evolved from those decisions. Great, so that completes a lot of uh, questions that we've taken from the audience. Uh, you know, we love case studies. I'm sure the audience also loves them too because this is where you see the concepts of net zero in action. And that kind of, uh, you know, spurs all these thoughts and this is what we should discuss. And this is how we move forward. Uh, thank you so much for taking all the questions. Before we wrap up, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, in 2021, we will be bringing a brand new Zero In Dialogue series to create the momentum for a transformative push towards grid interactive net zero energy buildings. These are highly energy efficient grid connected buildings that meet energy needs through renewable means while maintaining a two way communication with the grid to balance demand with electricity supply. The dialogue series are envisioned around four tracks. That's policy, design, technology, and occupants. Stay connected with us to learn more about this. We welcome all of you to join the NZEB Alliance. It's a network of innovators and early adopters of NZEB concept in India. 
the alliance aims to accelerate building sector towards NZEP goals by providing an open forum for exchange of thoughts, ideas, and success stories. You can sign up on our website to become a part of this alliance. We would like to feature high performing and net zero energy ready buildings that demonstrate feasibility of the net zero concept on this website. If you're interested in showcasing such project or you have worked on or you know of such a project, please write to us at nzeb at edsglobal.com. With that, we've come uh, to the end of today's webinar. Um, let's bid adieu to this year and look forward to the new year with optimism and move even faster towards zero. Hope you enjoy today's session and see you in the next one in 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler, for your time and you. uh, sharing all the information. Yeah. Bye.